Hello. There we are. I think I'm unmuted now. And it looks like I've got a video. How's that? All right, let's see. How's that? There I am. Yeah, I just disconnected. This thing usually works, but sometimes it's finicky, so we don't need it. Okay. Yeah, you got some good books in the background there. There's some good authors these days. Uh, it's it's not Victorian yeah. times anymore. Yeah. What's in the jar? What? Oh, here. Yeah. This is my inkwell. How how charming. Yes. Um, I had a beautiful metal quill. It, this was a, my Christmas gift in 2018 and for my friend when I was staying with her in Berlin. And uh, I had a little inkwell pen that came with it. But while I was doing a book lecture thing at the Kelly's Tower in Prague, um, the, <laughs> the guy I was staying with nicked it. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sure that uh, will be good karma for him. Yeah. Yeah, such is life, right? At least I still have the ink well. You know, things come and go. Can't take it with you. Right. Yeah, that's true. So that's true. Welcome to Magic Without Fears, the Hermetic Podcast. I'm your host, Frater RC, and thank you so much for finding the time to uh be my guest for episode 93. Well, you bet good number for an episode. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you had said no, I would have had to talk to someone like Richard Kaczynski or something like that. And yeah, uh, really, what, I was what, with Richard th last weekend. Yeah, I saw the photos, and maybe yeah. she's doing a good job uh, getting magic out there. Yeah, it's great to see. Do you remember uh, meeting me here in Vancouver or down at PantheaCon? Uh, yeah, you know, that's sort of unfair to ask me because I know uh, it's a hor it's a cruel question. You you should yes. remember me. But here's what here's one thing that's pretty cool. Um, when we did the Enochian work here with Troy Sprue in Vancouver, you signed my little book of Azrael, uh, Sir Sefer uh, Ratzio oh. Hamelech. You signed my little miniature version of Ratzio Hamelech in Hebrew. There you go. There's my yes. Ah, and I signed it, Rabbi Ben Clifford. And that meant a lot to me. That was a very nice uh, thing. Um, ben, Rabbi Ben Clifford, a beautiful uh, cognomen you have for yourself. And also the Enochian operation was very successful for me at the time. I was in between homes and needed some money for a rent uh, to get a new place. And the next day it just showed up after that, uh, the Enochian Aether we did when uh, with Tex and stuff. It was the first time I ever included, asked for money in magic or did magic money. First time in my life. Sometimes you just yeah. just need it. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I, I I didn't. I was skeptical of whether something like that could work. But the idea that the ethers are close to our reality, closer than a lot of the higher planes, I think, has something to do with the effectiveness of Enochian magic. I, I, that's my guess. I don't know. Any well, yeah, on it, that? consciousness is a weird thing, and and sometimes it. Uh, 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 dimensions and things like that uh, go in uh, flow in waves and sometimes they align with our material life and sometimes they don't you know so looks like you uh, you had good timing there it... yeah yeah well and it was wonderful of course to get to experience the way you've been doing in Enochian magic and uh, uh, for a very long time of course you've been doing it uh, that way with the your own approach, I guess you could say, though, of course, your own approach, so many so many of your innovations have become so popular that it's almost formed a, a new version of Enochian magic or a new tradition within the tradition, because, of course, that's all we really have with Enochian magic is fragments of a fragment. That's right. And everybody, uh, I, I tell people that, that are starting to study that, uh, uh, you know, don't... Uh, uh, don't feel bad or intimidated uh, that even from the beginning, you're on the cutting edge of the technology. So, you know, everybody is on the cutting edge of the technology. <laughs> Why do you think magic is having such a huge comeback these days? Well, there's, I'm sure there's lots of reasons for it, but uh, if you'll look in, you know, in the past, uh, the last, couple hundred years uh 
uh, public or, or uh, popular interest anyway in uh, in magic seems to uh, come and go with uh, 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 stresses and uncertainties in in uh, just the general objective reality situation <laughs> when wars and rumors of wars and and uh, uh, economic hard times and uncertainties and things like that uh, uh lots of people turn to uh uh spiritual alternatives uh to what's going on and that doesn't uh, necessarily mean that that's uh uh, uh truly serious interest but it's just sort of uh, uh, popular popular interest seems to come and go with uh, stresses in uh, uh, people's objective realities. If you'll look back at uh, at uh, occult explosions and stuff, it's always uh, prelude to war and things like that. So. Hmm. Yeah. Times Besides, of okay. That, that being said, okay. That being said, uh, I think there really is something to uh, uh, this idea of the change of an aeon uh, occurring. Um, uh, if you look back in history, even there, there's these axial periods uh, of. Uh, where all of a sudden some uh, things all over the world uh, are happening coincidentally all at the same time. Like, uh, oh, I mentioned like, like uh, 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 Pythagoras and Buddha and and, <laughs> and uh, Confucius and, and uh, uh, all sorts of uh, great world religions were started by guys that that could have had the same shrink, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I do think uh, that we are experiencing the effects of aeon change. Now, I know we're we're experiencing the effects of climate change, and the climate. Uh, uh, crisis, if you will. But I think that uh, consciousness-wise, humanity is undergoing the, the effects of aeon change. And uh, that can be very dramatic and traumatic to, uh, to those who uh, are uh, resisting that new influx of uh, of uh, consciousness, and so uh, the transitional periods of a of aeons are uh, uh, usually characterized by great social stresses and uh, and things like that. And uh, during these periods, uh, uh, it seems like uh, idiots become more Id idiotic and. <laughs> And cool people get cooler, you know. <laughs> so so uh, it's kind of a, a polarity thing at the at the uh, transition periods of of aeons. Now I don't know if you'd blame it on the uh, procession of the equinoxes, you know, the age of Aquarius and things like that. Uh, magicians, modern magicians, uh, Thelemites in particular. Uh, look to the the magical formula of consciousness has changed from the point of view that the sun dies every day, uh, which is uh, the so-called Osirian formula, where where our uh, everything is dominated uh, during a a magical aeon by the formula of the our perceived uh, relationship with the sun. So while we're conscious. Uh, well, humanity was uh, more or less dominated by the the mistaken belief that the sun dies, it comes up and goes down every day. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
that uh, uh, so all of our gods are dying gods, you know that that and uh, all of our insecurities are are uh, 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 wrapped up in uh, us at least subconsciously identifying with that son that dies. So we're all obsessed with death and and how we can bargain our way, you know, out of death. Uh, uh, because deep down inside, we're identifying with that sun, and we want to come up in the morning. Okay, we 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 want uh, that's our idea of eternal life is somehow making some kind of a deal so we can come up again, you know, resurrect and. Uh, but uh, enough of the people, the consciousness units in the in the world today, pretty much know that the sun stays on all the time. <laughs> we're we're pretty. I I mean, mothers all over the world, you know, tuck their babies in, saying, "Yo, know, don't be afraid of the dark because the sun is still on. It's on all the time." So now deepens enough of us. Uh, a significant amount of us, a number of us, uh, uh, have it firmly in place in our consciousness, and and all of our consciousnesses are are uh, linked, if in one way or another. Okay, um, enough of our consciousness is uh, is based in the 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 firm belief that the sun, giver of life. You know the the only visible God in our in our uh, 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 environment here it gives the life. Without the sun, we're we're dead. Uh, it stays on all the time. Night's an illusion, uh, and, and we identify with the sun. Night's an illusion, and so consequently, we're also coming to the realization that death is also an illusion and in our, our desire for for uh, uh, continuous consciousness our desire to resurrect really isn't a need to resurrect it's just for us to identify with the consciousness of the continuity of our existence the sun is a continuity of existence, and so are we. And so that that you don't have to to uh, uh, associate that with anybody's holy book. You don't have to associate it with anybody's cult or anybody's religion or anything else. Humanity has changed as a whole because we're now more or less thinking in terms of hey, you know. Sun stays on all the time. I stay on all the time. This, this, and we might not accept it, you know, consciously, but subconsciously, we know if we're on right now, we've always been on and will always be on until we realize we've been each other all along. Okay. And so the, the, this uh, call it subconscious new reality uh, brings about this uh, this change of consciousness. So in this transitional period, we're getting resistance, sometimes violent resistance, from those who aren't ready to actually wake up to that realization there's there they've got their heels dug in to the sun dies every day you know we die every day give me that old time religion you know if it was <laughs> if the king james version of the bible was good enough for moses it's good enough for me you know uh, jesus is what i always say you're the only other person i've heard say that since i left seminary um, well, yeah. since, right, let's be clear. Since I graduated from seminary, oh yes, yeah. you know, all oh, right, drop out priests. No, I'm one of those priests that went full apostate after graduation. Well, I I think you're the the only one who graduated. <laughs> um, 
I became aware in seminary that mystical theology is considered an academic discipline in, in at UBC and other schools that have theological colleges. And I was like, oh, wow. And there's this whole language around it, which ever since I've been trying to introduce more into the mainstream occult world so that we have more uh, technical tools to describe very subtle states of experience. And yeah. I think we're only beginning to to look at uh, where our understanding might go of these things, especially as we see science now um, experimenting with entheogens and plant medicine and also just consciousness, like in the work that pseudoscientists like Dr. Dean Radin and Dr. Jeffrey Mishlove are, are engaged in, in parapsychology and other magical studies in the lab. Right. They're written off and suppressed. Like if you put if I if you if I interviewed Dr. Raiden on my YouTube, my YouTube would never grow another subscriber. It would be shut down, which is crazy how much they're trying to suppress scientists studying magic. Wow. Well, anyway, um, I guess I'm too low on the on the, the radar to upset anybody. You know, so I think it's yeah, I think you're safe because you're not like a PhD in electrical engineering, because those are the people that sort of threaten the prevailing ways of thinking. Right. Yes. So they're like, I can explain this to you. And they're like, no, thanks. We don't need to hear it. Right. Whereas we're more like we can show you how to experience what we're talking about. Like we can you know, take some of the mystical states, but don't necessarily understand how the photons work. Right. Right. I'm more of an anecdotal guy. That's it's why it's why I love you. I think that's why so many people love you. I, I I very much appreciate your biographical approach to communicating magic to the broader culture. And I think it's one of the most valuable things any occultist has done in the 20th century, to be honest. So I think we all owe you a great debt for for being brave enough to to go that direction with it. And it's you got to be so, so vulnerable and so open to do that. It's very hard. Um, I, I, it just the little I've put my my stepped out in the world, like, you know, there's no community. Occultists love to stomp on your toes if they can. <laughs> I, a Golden Dawn chief just called me a me and my last podcast guest an oath, oath breakers not an hour before we started this podcast. You know? <laughs> oh, and, no. And he's from an order that's based on Regardi's books, not from anything <laughs> else. So it's like, and to boot, he did a podcast in England with me at his house while he was drunk and breaking his oath left, right, and center. I removed uh, it at his request, but he's then calling my next guest recently. Uh, yeah, it's crazy that people still like to use this like heretic and like like we say those words as like with a tongue in tongue in cheek. Sure, but some people right. are still like legit hurling that stuff around from their glass houses. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's the stuff that keeps us on our toes and stomps on them occasionally. Yeah. Well, what's your, what's your take on that whole that whole idea of of, of um like people are learning this stuff from books and the reason a lot of uh, uh you're the head of the oto internationally right and no, I'm, de I'm i'm a deputy u.s deputy grandmaster yeah well you can tell that to people they'll still think you're the international top dog whether you like it or not, probably. Well, I'm, 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 I'm an officer. I've always yeah. been an officer in the international. Line. I understand. Yeah. I don't, uh, to be respectful, I don't know OTO polity enough to even comment. So forgive my uh -huh. my, uh, my uh, bull in China shop there. Um, but the, uh, yeah, like the fact that people, you, you, you people, people write these books, even Golden Dawn people like Pat Zaleski and Tony Fuller and others are publishing Golden Dawn stuff. And the idea is to give people correct information to counterbalance against all the people who are legit grifting shills, just making stuff up to make money. And they've got no serious interest in the training. Those people are out there. And that's why we need to counter bad information with good. It's the best way to fight misinformation and disinformation, yeah. malinformation, or there's a lot of kinds of information these days, if you hadn't noticed, apparently. <laughs> I, th I actually I think the uh, if you belong to an organization, your your signs of recognition to to let every to let another member of that same organization know that you belong to that organization. You, so that the handshakes, handshake keep your handshake secret. You know the signs of recognition. The secret stuff should be the stuff how you identify yourself to each other in an elevator, you know. Oh, hi! I think you're okay. You know that you can keep secret. Everything else, hey, it's out there. 
Regardi yeah. was like that, okay? He was wonderful like that, okay? He's, uh, 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 I was so lucky to, to, uh, uh, to meet him pretty early on in my adventure uh, here. And his attitude was just so, so open and and easy going and uh sorry who is uh, this israel regarding oh israel regarding yeah sorry I, I must have missed that for some reason sorry <laughs> but uh, but anyway the oh, that's yeah the only, thought, but... only only real secret stuff I, if you think you can you can betray a magical secret okay uh you, you got to ask yourself do you really know the secret to begin with and <laughs> And uh, and why on earth would you uh, uh, begrudge, you know, uh, 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 sharing it to someone who is capable of understanding it? Uh, organizations are fine. I, I wouldn't tell you OTO uh, uh, handshakes. I wouldn't tell you OTO, uh, uh, you know, degree words or anything like that. But the real secrets are incommunicable. They're just incommunicable. Yeah. You, you either have it or you don't have it. And if someone else uh, someone else has it, doesn't matter what organization they belong to. Just, just don't just don't start saying that you're that organization and charging dues for it, I guess. Is, yeah, is, right. Is the yeah. objection. But yeah, to me, it's the idea that, that like, you know, criticize if someone buys modern magic or or the Tree of Life by Regardi and learns the LBRP and then they start taking people to the park and they all do the LBRP together. And we live in a place where that's possible and not crazy. To me, that's something that should be celebrated, not like you damn oath breaker, you how dare yeah. you. And it's like this person's not even in an order. They just bought a copy of modern magic or something one of those books you know and now they're having now they're and they changed their life with it they got out of an abusive relationship they changed their career and are doing much better now and so they're doing lbrps at the park with a group of people in boulder colorado oh my god call the cops yeah you heretic oath breaker heterodox bastards oh what are you doing so like seeing this polemic and this vitriol still from golden dawn people towards that and in the same breath saying i'd love to share the lbrp with my friends and family who are asking about it but i can't because it would break my oath it's like you're full of shit i'm sorry pardon my french i'm sorry oh, that's, I, I totally agree so i got a little worked up this yeah, is what happens when we do it on a tuesday with mars in the air yeah i i i really don't get much of that um uh, uh, and if i do sometimes it's you know it comes out of out of uh left field uh on facebook or so, something like that and um uh but i i got to remember i got to think back and remember what i was like uh, in the first 2 years i was into all of this okay and i had read a couple books and uh i had a pretty good idea of uh uh, uh which which author or which uh, uh, school of thought that uh, seemed superior to me. And then all of a sudden, everything else seemed like, oh, you're an idiot. You're a moron. Oh, you, you know, you, you've got a path on the tree of life going from four to three, you moron, you know, and uh, not realizing that there's, you know, plenty of good ancient Kabbalists that did that too, you know, it's just, um, uh, so I remember w when I was uh, uh, quick to be uh, a, a magical snob, uh, especially when I thought I knew just a little bit more than the, the person I was uh, criticizing. So, so I tried to uh, uh, at least be tolerant up to a point of where people are, are coming from. But if they're too much of a jerk, that's what Facebook is good for blocking yeah 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 Unfriending, you know yeah i don't i don't need this anymore you know yeah i basically have been off it all year i just was like no and then i'm less than a week back on it and already it's like 
<laughs> you know, the Holy Inquisition coming after me for having open-minded conversations with cool new people. <laughs> it's sort of my, it's sort of my, uh, uh, my platform. If you, I do a show every day at 10, 10 a.m. in the morning, uh, uh, seven days a week. And I've done it for almost three years now. Yeah, I'm very aware. I've watched many, many of them. Oh, good. Oh, yeah, of course. Some of them are better than others, but uh, I try to pull myself together. Uh, on Tuesdays, I do it in the parking lot of the the, the stores that I, uh, Tuesday shopping day, I take Constance uh, to the to the farmer's market and things like that. So my shows are in the car. And today it's 108 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. You can tell I'm probably, you can probably see how much I'm sweating here on a hot day in Vancouver, but I'm pretty sure it's like 75 degrees here. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's at least uh, it, uh, right out there right now in the backyard, just outside yeah. of the window there. Uh, it's, uh, I think, around 111. Uh, my wife's out there. Times. Yeah. Put her in the garden. Wow. Wow, yeah. tough lady. Yeah. She is a tough lady. And that's why I can be such a softy. Oh, wow. Tough lady. I don't know if Take I want to cry into this one, but I'll leave that. Let that oh, lie. don't cross her. Don't. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. As a matter of and fact, you... I dedicated this book to her. That's, uh, that's yeah, that's, let's talk about that. Yeah, well, wh I called her. Well, Grady McMurtry, the head of the OTO uh, at the time, back in the, like the 1976 or 7, uh, called her St. Constance of the Well, Our Lady of Perpetual Motion. And she's kept that. That's part of her magical uh, uh, title. And so, uh, and her, uh, she is... Uh, in the Ecclesia Gnostica Catholica, which is the the church in the the uh, ecclesiastical arm of the OTO, uh, which uh, uh, has a wandering bishop uh, apostolic link, uh, she's a bishop too, and her bishop name is Tau Justice. And uh, which is perfect because uh, I'm all into the the idea that the adepts of uh, adepts of Thelema, disciples of Thelema, are busy manifesting the formula of Horus, wild and crazy. That's why it's, the world is such a violent, bloodthirsty, uh, uh, revolutionary time. But the adepts of Thelema. Their job is to prepare the way for the next day on. Okay. And uh, uh, and that's the aeon of of Maha. Okay. And uh, and that's like the, the goddess justice. Okay. Yeah. That's uh, what comes, that's the only hope I've got for for whatever is left of humanity here. Is that uh, the next day on will be uh, uh, a readjustment coming back into balance, and uh, so Tao Justice or da, uh, is a perfect thing. So this work is dedicated to Saint Constance of the Well, Her Grace Bishop Tao Justice of Ecclesia Gnostica Catholica. Yeah, so this is a your new re-released book based on some updated, updated findings and information. What's the major? What were the major updates, or what were the bits of information from those updates that caught your ear or your eye and made you decide to uh, expand and re-release this? Uh, um, let me. I can't describe it in one word, but let's go with challenging for now. Well, it's a no, it's it's a novel. Okay, when I first. Uh, uh, we could literally say that I've been writing this for 25 years. Really? Wow. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I was, I was in the shower. I was taking a shower 
And for some, you know, you know how showers are. They're like telephone booths to God. <laughs> and I don't know what got me thinking about this, um, except um, uh, I had been reading, uh, uh, you know, several sort of the the the, the pop culture uh, books. Uh, but they talked about the Essenes and the Therapeutae and the, the idea that uh, it was it pretty clear that the historic person upon whom the, the fable or the myth of Jesus came, there was probably a historical character involved. I don't really have too much of a doubt about that. But chances are the the words coming out of his mouth, at least as chronicled in the four Gospels. Let's just leave Paul out of this completely. Okay. Yeah. To me, Paul is persona non grata. Okay. In, uh, okay. Um, well, I got that from very early on in this book. Yes. Uh, I knew this part the, of the interview would be so much fun. So yes, I'll let you go. But the but the gospels, the the four gospels, uh, you know, which were put together several hundred years after the after the historical events, at least tried to to be in sync with each other on the on major points. Okay, and I started to think, okay. There's got to be just normal circumstances in a human being's life, especially if if they're involved in politics of of the day, and especially if they're involved in uh, uh, mystical training and spiritual activities, like the Essenes were healers, and and uh, uh, they had this this. Uh, uh, uh mystical almost zen like uh almost buddhist like uh 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 spiritual point of view and they were always at odds with the temple establishment you know which is just into uh, uh they were sort of like organized religion you know let's just slaughter a bunch of animals and and uh um uh, uh sort of be in spiritual crowd control mode well yeah and they had they unified power and eradicated the hill shrines and all that stuff right the, right and, and right thrown, and, thrown out <laughs> after get rid of that mother goddess yeah and so uh and and that sort of surfaces with the story of john the baptist because they were cousins you know uh and then somewhere along the line i read that Wait a sec. Joseph, the father of Jesus, wasn't poor. Okay. He was a direct descendant of David. Okay. And Mary was not just this poor little girl that he must have felt sorry for and married her. Uh, uh, Mary's family were the Benjamites. And the Benjamites owned the real estate of central Jerusalem where the temple was built. And Mary's uh, Mary's uh, aunt was uh, uh, married to Zechariah, the high priest of all of Israel, okay? These people were well-connected, wealthy people. If he was a carpenter, it must have been a nickname because he was more like uh, a huge building contractor, okay, uh, that uh, he was wealthy and they'd been wealthy for, they were the equivalent of, no, not the equivalent of, they were Jewish royalty. The family was of Jewish royalty when Jesus was born or when... Uh, uh, John the Baptist was born. His father Zechariah and his and uh, his mother 
who was also a Benjamite, represented a joining of two bloodlines, the bloodline of the Benjamites and the bloodline of David. Now, whether or not there was any historic validity to that story at all, it's it doesn't matter because it was legend and legend is truer in religion. Legend is truer than empirical history. The John the Baptist, when he was born, it was like the bloodline of King David and King Saul, because the Benjamites came from King Saul, Israel's first king. Okay. And they, it, there was an estrangement. It was a bringing together of that bloodline. And why was that important? Because everybody was looking for a figurehead to kick the Herodians off the throne of Israel and perhaps even kick the Romans out. Okay, they were looking for the perfect figurehead. They were looking for a prince that they could that they could rally an, an army around, that they could rally a political claimant uh, uh, to uh, the, the puppet regime of, of the Herodians. So when John the Baptist was born, he was pegged for that role. The voice of the wilderness. Uh, yes. But when Joseph married Mary, Mary's bloodline was a little bit more direct to Saul than uh, John the Baptist's mother. So when John the Baptist was born, they were already prepping him for this role. They were going to educate him in a certain way. They were going to, because just in a few short years, it's going to be 10 years or seven, you know, maybe 15 years. We're going to get this guy. We're going to put him on the throne. Uh, but when Jesus was born, his, his star blazed brighter. His bloodline ran purer, just a tad than John the Baptist. And so they had to rearrange their, their, their plot. Okay. And that, that's when John said, you still got an important part. You know, you'll, let's see, we've got this, uh, this uh, prophecy in Isaiah here that, okay, the, yes, the voice crying in the wilderness. Okay. You'll prepare the way. And John just became a, a, like a Nazarite which is not mean, doesn't mean he came from the town of Nazareth it meant he was a he ate locusts and stuff he was uh, okay yeah any anyway. usually not positive when they have the ite on the end like the moabites or the canaanites in the mouth. it's usually it's usually a bad sign anyway so that's that and I was thinking about all of this. I'll get you back into my shower if it kills me here. Um, I was thinking about that in the in the shower, and for some reason, I started thinking about the sequence of events that really nobody thought Jesus was a celebrity. I mean, among the people. Nobody thought he was a celebrity. Nobody thought he was a holy man. Nobody thought he was a miracle worker. Nobody thought he was perhaps a magician of some kind until he turned the water into wine at the marriage feast at Cana. Mm -hmm. And in that shower, I figured out exactly how he did that. And he doesn't have to be a supernatural spook of any kind. The circumstances of the event were so clear that I jumped out of the shower and ex and described it to Constance. And she said, yes, of course, that's how he, that's what happened. And then I told everybody at Monday night class, and they said, oh my God, yes. You know, and everybody just, 
got a big kick out of that. So well, before I forget it, I'm going to have to write it down. So th that's what I tried to do. Uh, the, the story itself of the wedding at Cana is pretty short, but yeah. but the buildup to it, okay, the backstory to make all of that make sense, to put it in historic and then, of course, Lon's imagination too here, uh, it became too long for a short story and too short for a novel. And so I went to work saying I tackled all the other miracles and put those in perspective. And then all of a sudden, the, char the characters as outlined in the Gospels, all of a sudden I had to insert them and they came to life. Now, I'm, you know me, I don't write novels. Okay, this. And so the, the idea of uh, of the 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 process of writing a novel i had no idea that you can sort of invent a character and they come to life on their own they they write it for you and, and you're just trying to type it as fast as as uh, the characters start to interact with each other and so uh, uh I got it to the point of where it was like novel at size. And uh, it just sort of sat there. And uh, a good friend of mine who was, uh, 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 I was in Japan and he was, uh, uh, he said, look, let me publish, let me self publish it for you, you know? And so it was called accidental Christ. And, uh, uh, he he published it in hardbound, uh, and it was a beautiful edition, and it had sumi e uh, uh, illustrations and things like that. But of course, nothing nothing ever came of it. And then, fast forward twenty years, <laughs> literally, fast forward twenty years. And it's been sitting there, going nowhere. And I thought, okay, I'm really going to invent a backstory to this. And, you know, I left everybody hanging at Gethsemane. And actually, I, let, I got it. I left everybody hanging at Golgotha. <laughs> so... Uh, and everybody said, you can't end it this way. You just can't end it this way. And so I ended it better, okay, longer. Not only that, but I added new characters, including Pontius Pilate's wife, which was, was, was a whole aspect of, the, of, the, of his support system that I had completely ignored in the first draft. So it's considerably expanded from that that first uh, uh, kind of self-published uh, edition. And of course, the people at uh, uh, Llewellyn were kind enough to to say, "Yeah, we'll we'll do it." You know, so yeah, that's cool. that. I'm so glad they did. I'm so glad they did. Um, I spent all day yesterday with it and enjoying it and. Uh, into the late night and uh, wrestling with some of the ideas. Honestly, I was thinking it would be much less challenging than it was for me um, because I actually had my, like I actually converted to Christianity and had my conversion experience while in the nineties, while reading, I was in the portal grade in the golden dawn and I was reading. So doing all that, you know, portal work. And I was reading Nico Kazantzakis is the last temptation. And that's what converted me. And so, you know, well, if that's what converted you to Catholicism, you're my no. type, type of Catholic. Yeah. Yeah. But then and and then I, but then when I was reading this, I was like this. I was surprised by how much it was challenging me. And some of the ideas and interactions like caused like a visceral. Um, I don't want to say upset, but like, you know, I was like, hmm, you know, and I was like, OK, there's a bit more that I have. I, I was surprised at how much I will 
continue probably wrestling with some of the characterizations and ideas and that and so that it really defied my expectations in that regard so well done it is not just Thank another you. alternate history of christ and there's so there's some good ones out there like zealot is an interesting one um that we had to read in seminary for and it you know it's the high it's a novelization as if jesus were one of the zealots and that sort of thing and your You're idea right. like from the get-go with the egyptian priest when he's 11 years old in egypt and the egyptian priest in you know stuttering i don't want to spoil the book because people really should check it out it's 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 wild and great and it's written by you so you, you know the, when i ask people for question listener questions for you from from my fans most of them just sent me messages of praise about you <laughs> they're, just like, they're just praising your sense of humor for him like you know there's no question marks here <laughs> It was, I ended up spending hours just getting people's praise about you and not oh. as, well, me, and one question, maybe two. I have them written down here, but um, okay. yeah. So this is a beautiful uh, and challenging book. Like the priest is telling him, this is the only spoiler I'll give, but it's in the beginning, so you won't, it doesn't spoil much, that he's the chosen one. No shock that, you know, that doesn't spoil much. Jesus, you're the chosen one. You're meant to be the king of the Jews and all of this. And his reaction is sort of, you know, he doesn't really have a problem with the Jews. Well, wait, how about, can I read it? Sure. Can I read what he says? Sure. Is the... So Jesus is in shock. He says, this is absurd. Young Jesus considered the Israelites to be a culture of superstitious tribesmen who slavishly worshipped a violent and fickle desert demon who demanded to be fed an endless flood of animal blood. <laughs> Get this now at your local bookstore. Yes, it is. All you, all the, so, like, it's wild. It's wild. Why? My question is. If he, the priest and his father, Joseph, were training him and edu having him educated amongst the therapeutae in Egypt to be the king of the Jews, wouldn't they have been a bit more careful about giving him that kind of impression about the very people he's called to lead? Well, remember, he's 11 years old. Yeah. Okay. I mean, and he's, and he's, uh, he's uh, actually uh, a pretty bright student in a pretty uh, uh, elegant or elegant lifestyle okay because he's it's it's like a very very snooty uh, boarding school and he has been uh, uh, he likes Egypt okay he he likes his uh, uh, his life there and he has very little memory because even as the gospels say, they got him out of town. The 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 Persian uh, uh, magi just totally blew his cover by by going to Herod and say, "Hey, <laughs> you hey, you know, <laughs> we're new in town, but uh, you know that we we heard that the next king had got born. You know what town is he in? You know, and." Uh, so so Herod, uh, uh, you know, the, he was in danger. He really was. So they went to Egypt, and that's where they leave it. Okay, the next time we see uh, Jesus in the Bible, he's he's on the temple steps arguing Kabbalah with uh, with the, uh, okay, like he's been educated somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and where I came from. Um, uh, in Sunday school, it was it was like, uh, oh, God just uh, uh, poured all of this, <laughs> this this wisdom where he could argue with with uh, these anal retentive uh, uh, cabalistic uh, scholars. Uh, no, he had to, he had to be educated enough to do that. So the the uh, the the idea. That he was quite satisfied with uh, uh, the, his schooling and where he was, and he really didn't want to go back to that land of scorpions uh, and, uh, and and do anything. As a matter of fact, this was the first he heard of this whole this whole plot. And yeah. if imagine if you were an eleven-year-old kid, and well, that's what I've been trying to do. 
is to yeah. put myself in Jesus's shoes, you know, imitatio yeah. Christi, of course. Um, but as an 11 year old in, in this uh, cosmopolitan Alexandria of the first century, which I mean, if only we could check, check that out for a day. Yeah, right. well, we could go back for a day and just check it out and just oh my god and steal as many manuscripts as we could. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it must have been so cool it and such a, so cool. such a culture shock to go back to Judea. You know, uh, that's the thing I've been thinking a lot. It's a wonderful thing to to contemplate the the idea that of of going from that sort of aristocratic um and elite educational environment to one where education and and elite um, knowledge is contained within the the Pharisees and Sadducees, right? And right. of course, well, we now know, of course, that the women in the, the ancient Judea had a magical tradition that they practiced from recent archaeological right. studies by Duke University. By recent, yep. I mean twenty years ago. So there was actually quite a balance, pa power balance, with men as the spiritual leaders of the community in the community, and then the women, the spiritual leaders in the household. Which, if anyone's ever been married, as you and I have been, um, we know that's the probably the smart move. I should have learned it sooner. I might still be married. Yeah, I've been married since since Jesus was alive. Yes. Yes. So. Yes. That's what I was saying. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, he, you know, to to go from uh, those environments, I guess. Yeah, it's it's a very interesting premise for 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 the narrative, and and you based it on the rediscovery of some of these older texts. Yeah. The Clopasian manuscripts, which even the Vatican found a copy of. Right. Yes. You gotta remember That's, it's a it's a novel yes i know well i love yes i, I love the how uh how tricky you are with some of that uh stuff like there's a few times i google things and i was like yeah, that's not a thing. Okay. But <laughs> you, you you presented it so well. I'm like, oh my God. Oh my God. Just uh just a treat. Just a treat. So folks, um, I hope you've heard en enough to go get a copy of this because it's it's a wonderful text and uh and uh and uh yeah, just uh only only you could have written this book. So so thanks for thanks for that one. You've written so many. I mean, this is can we talk about this one just briefly? Because again, everyone always calls this a masterpiece, but it really is. I mean, just just the the introduction to it alone is is so so well done. Um, I think when I first met you, you said this was your can you consider this your favorite book or your best book? I'm not sure which yeah, word. Yeah, it's, pro it's probably uh, yeah. I I don't think I've ever been smarter. I've gotten I've gotten a lot dumber since I wrote that. Yeah, I was. Well, yeah, I did, you know, I did, I didn't, I, um, that other book that you've got, uh, just one book over, over from it, the, the book of Thoth. Yeah. Um, no. um, now that's Crowley's, that's really the, the most authoritative book on the, the Thoth tarot, but it's kind of a difficult read. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And that's an understatement. And um, I was, how much time we got? I don't know if as I much as you want. Usually these podcasts go two, three hours, but as long as you have I, three hours, I wouldn't expect you to go for three hours. So, you know, oh, whatever no. time you have. Yeah, please, do, please don't. I'm 75. No, years I old. wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Yeah. Um, plus, it's such a hot day up, up here. There's, so, you know, this is hot and there's biological needs, you know. Um, if you have another half hour, that's that would be an honor. The the I I was at the, I I had done the magic of Alistair Crowley. Well, let's see where yeah it was called the magic of Thelema at the time. Yeah, that's your did, new one. Yeah. 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 I it was look to the magic of Alistair out. Crowley. And yeah, I, um, I need to check out that one and Marco's one. There's the two new Crowley books out on a the I had uh, done the first uh, the first edition of that uh, uh, way way back when I don't don't know when the let's see uh, the first one was uh, where's the dates on this uh, anyway I can't really oh no, 1993 so 30 years ago yeah. Uh, and uh, I wrote it to sort of make that uh, uh, 
uh, Crowley's magic and theory and practice understandable. Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to, to make a handbook of the rituals of Aleister Crowley. And uh, uh, so it was one of my first and earliest, uh, earliest books. And it was uh, 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 well received. Okay, let's just say it was very well received. And um, the the occult buyer, the the head of the department of uh, acquisitions of New Leaf Distributing Company, which was the the largest North American distributor of um, uh, esoteric material, uh, New Leaf. Uh, uh, met with me at the at the Book Expo America in Chicago. I, yeah, it's in Chicago. And uh, she said, I want to talk with you at your, I want to meet with you at your publishers uh, at six o'clock. That's, that's when the, this convention ended. And uh, I said, okay. And uh, so she had made an appointment with uh, uh, Donald Weiser, uh, of Weiser, uh, Samuel Weiser books, it was called in those days, and Betty, Betty Lundstedt, his, uh, his wife and partner. And they had already had a little table set up and everything else. And I, and I just thought we were going to meet to see where we're going for drinks, you know, after I had no idea I was being set up for this. And she had uh, Crowley's Magic and Theory and Practice, and she had my book, The Magic of uh, uh, Thelema, at the time. That's the, the title. And she started to talk. And she said, I'm no dummy. I could still hear her saying this. I'm no dummy. But I couldn't make heads or tails. For years, I've tried to make heads or tails of the magic and theory and practice. Okay. And then she threw down the, the magic of Aleister Crowley and said, I understood this. I read this in three bowel movements. <laughs> and it all makes sense to Crowley me. Crowley would have loved that description, yeah. by the way, wouldn't he? And said, uh, he did uh, the, the impossible. Okay, and I feel weird this but this uh, more or less was her her uh her take and then she got out the book of thoth crowley's book of thoth that weiser published she says and i don't understand this one either okay lon's got to write the book that explains this one to me because this one is the most important book on tarot ever written and no one can understand it <laughs> okay. i i admit i it was in 93 i got my first copy of magic and theory and practice one of those beautiful old hard covers and and i really loved it i though there was parts that were challenging for me because i was 13 at the time and i wished right. i'd known about your book in those days it was hard to find books if they weren't in the local bookstore right absolutely yeah, well and i did have by that but i yeah i couldn't make heads nor tails of that when i was you know in grade eight and nine um unfortunately and i was just i Lucky had not, i had not said a word okay i just sat there you know uh alternating between uh m my head swelling and sheer terror and uh, then donald looked at betty his partner and then looked at me and said Okay, Lon, do it. Now, I didn't feel prepared in any way to do a book like that. Okay. I never fantasized doing that. Okay. I hate work. I'm lazy. It's it, not only that, but I didn't think I had the brains or the concentration or the or the tenacity. That was a huge, huge project for me. And it took almost three years to write it. But I learned early on, it's hard enough to get published, okay? 
getting published is not easy. And when something like that falls in your lap, it's like the gods are putting it there, you know. <laughs> You'd, yeah. Or it, it's it's like when you're you're given the opportunity to take the next initiation in whatever order you're in. Okay, you don't say, "Oh, maybe I'll put that off." No. When someone says, "This initiation will be available to you on this on this." Uh, such and such a date, you take the initiation. Okay. Well, I took the initiation and that was, uh, it turned out to be the a pain in the ass to write. I was up many nights with a magnifying glass looking at those, those tarot cards to, uh, uh, to get every little, uh, uh you know and not all the 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 cards are that well produced um but anyway it turned out in my opinion to be the best book i've i've ever written and uh denny on foolish fish was just praising it the other week and 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 you know not, no surprise there it deserves all the praise that you can get in it it's 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 extra territorial and it's appeal to people you don't have to be into Crowley or the Thoth Tarot at all to love that book that you've written. So on behalf of the whole world, once again, thank you very much, good sir. Oh, you're welcome. Sure. Yeah. I see you got the complete Enochian dictionary back there too. Yes. Yes. Well, I but the I I I Enochian was one of the first things me and my best friend started doing in, in 93, 94. Of course, the Schuler books were out. It was all the rage. Enochian physics, it's gonna change the universe. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, we were we were young enough kids to uh, not know much about physics and and you know bring it to our physics professors and be able to teachers in high school and be like, you're wrong. See proof. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've been I've had an I've had the Laycock book for years. Um, yeah, it's and I got been it. very helpful. Very yeah, helpful. I I'm really excited about the new edition, even though I believe all it has is a new sort of forward or intro to it. Yeah, it's 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 the same, but it's a great text. And I see you've got uh, the tarot cards there, my tarot cards. I love your tarot cards. I love your tarot cards so much. Not only because they're drawn by you and they're they're a self-made deck. You know, Golden Dawn's very big into coloring our own cards, drawing our own cards. So that's a part of the tradition that you've then taken into forward into Thelema, uh, like Crowley did himself. And uh it's so inspiring to me to to suggest to people to make their own. I, I think people like you are part of why so many people today feel that freedom to interpret the the arcana in, uh, for themselves. And of course, the fact that you included so many different sigils um, on them in correspondences is is incredibly useful. Incredibly useful. I don't use the Crowley deck thought deck anymore because I'm an Aquarius and I was very attached to Tzadi being where Tzadi is meant to be. And so I do, you know, when I, like I said, I'm not allergic to Thelema, but there's things in it that just don't work with my microcosm. They, yeah. You know, no, Tzadi no, is Aquarius no. and it, it, you can't switch it with hay for me. And so, hey man, I'm going to stick with no the worry. bar that no I am. About it. Just, uh, <laughs> yeah, just put it, put it back there. Because, but I uh, love it. And it was out of print for ages. The only copies I could find were like four hundred dollars. My buddy had one in town, and like you know, he was going to give it yeah. to me, and then I told him how much it was selling for, and he was like, "Oh, oh, actually, I'll keep it." <laughs> it's like, yeah, you should. Well, I like the the Enochian, uh, the Enochian stuff on uh, on the cards, uh, and Especially it's since it's plus it's the Golden Dawn Enochian, which is cool yeah. because yeah. that that makes it kind of a golden dawny deck in a way it's sure. more so than a nokian purist um and that's really cool for golden dawn people yeah yeah and uh it's really helpful because uh it's sort of my uh, magical temple in a box and because i always take a deck of tarot cards with me when i travel uh yeah i, could, I you love know, I could... the magician you drew so oh. much i love it so much I also love the Regardi Wang magician a lot. Those those 
might be my two favorite magicians. Actually, I like the the Nick Farrell magician, even though people say it looks like Nick himself. He he says the artist did whatever the artist wanted, but I don't care oh, if it looks I, like Nick or I not. Got, I, think I, it's got, a great I got me in this deck too. I, oh, who are you? Oh, I'm the Hierophant in uh who else am I? I'm the hanged I'm the hanged man. You're the hanged man too? Yeah, my wife is the Empress. Of course. And, yeah. uh, oh, I'm the I'm also the Emperor, I think. Yeah. yeah I, I mean honest. Honest, I tried to put my my face on all of them. I just, just I couldn't figure out how to do it, you know. But uh, <laughs> Well, because they do all represent you anyway. So yeah, there's that's yeah, constant. That's beautiful. Yeah, what a and uh, there she is. There also, she is where I am, and our friend uh, Steve Abbott. Uh, let's see if I found anybody. Oh, I'm in the chariot too. I forgot. Yeah. All right. yeah. Cool. Because they're funky, you know. They're, uh, I did the line drawings, and then I gave Constance uh, a, sh a sheet that uh, uh, indicated what color scales that she could use on each individual card, and uh, turned her loose uh, on it. So she's responsible for the the coloring maybe not the choice of colors but the actually uh, 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 applying them and she uh, I gave her uh, a set of uh, just regular index cards that I had printed up with the line drawings on it including the Enochian and everything and uh, then uh, just a week before uh, I drove from Newport Beach, California to Miami to pitch the deck to U.S. Games, um, she colored it. She did like five a day, you wow. know? Yeah. So. Yes, you you uh, you lucked out with your partner meeting in high school and happily ever after ever since so that's a that's a wonderful thing um yeah. and the fact that you teamed up on the tarot deck it makes it even cooler right i got, i went to waldorf school my whole life so the idea of drawing your own tarot deck like we don't have textbooks you have to the students create we create our own textbooks from the class lectures in waldorf and so that, right. that the fact that you were shading and highlighting and beautifying every single bit of information we put in it just uh, makes me so appreciative of the the uh personal involvement in 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 art right this idea it's not just for professionals or experts or people who are trained um i sort of feel the same way about music you know it got overly professionalized and a lot of people are like oh i can't do music because i'm not a pro and, and as as you know being a pro that that's that's a very sad state of affairs for music <laughs> oh yeah do you well, have anyway, any the, the, the b-o-t-a BOTA uh, is great. Yeah, I took the BOTA uh, uh, courses, uh, Tarot Fundamentals, and then I forget what the second one's called, and then uh, Kabbalah. Uh, but I colored a, a BOTA deck, which uh, I tell you, it changes your consciousness. I mean, you're, I colored the Fool card. Uh, and you meditate for a week uh, uh, on it. And I tell you, my dreams just cracked open. Okay, it wow. was full technicolor uh, mystical experience. And I go, okay, I I get it. I get it. I'm, uh, I'm squirting WD-40 into my soul. <laughs> I'm, I'm firing on all on different cylinders this is wonderful yeah that's definitely why in the golden dawn it's so important for the students to draw the diagrams out themselves and color them in and, and all of that it's something i think that has been lost quite a bit with the accessibility of published literature so i i hope that uh people uh, hear this sort of these sort of podcasts and and uh feel a bit encouraged to you know be 
if you're not a drawer, try, you know, it's that you can't really fail. Just, just do the best you can. And I've seen great decks made with stick characters. Okay. Just stick characters with uh, geometric uh, little uh, uh, simple cups and simple, simple things. Uh, so uh, yeah, just do it. And uh, at Monday night magic class, we've all, we've all made our own tarot cards and uh so some of them can be pretty funky i got, I got a bin of them back there well when you tell people they can go and be creative with something sometimes you're a little yeah you can be it can be surprising how creative they get you're like whoa yeah. okay yeah. Um, but yeah that's yep. part of the part of the beauty of it for sure um so can i ask you um uh you have a bit more time uh yeah let's go to let's go to the bottom of the hour okay we got 10 more minutes so i always this 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 might seem like a controversial thing but honestly i think it's a question that has been asked and answered and might not even need an answer from you honestly but um i always thought i understood what you meant by the phrase the very common phrase now um it's all in your head you just don't know how big your head is i always took that to mean um, I thought I was interpreted that for myself as the idea of the Neoplatonic mind, the all is mind, the noose, the light, you know, and so if everything is mind, then of course, it's all in your head, because everything that exists is in your head, and maybe head or noose is all that is how. So yeah, I always thought that was how I had to interpret it. So when you say if you so if someone says spirits aren't real or are real, it's sort of a moot point at that stage. However, right. however, then this beautiful book, which you wrote a forward for, came out, and there was also a forward by proposing a counterpoint by Stephen Skinner. Now, based on my longstanding interpretation of what you meant, there is no contradiction in the things you or he would be arguing for. However, it does seem there is some sort of con. There is there a contradiction in your view versus his? In your opinion, have you read his? forward there do you have any oh yeah like have you answered has this question i said to some of my friends i said i think the answer has been asked and answered and there's nothing more to say on it based on what's said in here but i will ask you anyway oh well that's that's uh uh in my understanding of my own words yes. there is no contradiction between stephen's uh uh point of view and and mine as a matter of fact I think they they are self-defining and self-referential. Um, I just get a kick out of the way he starts his and the way I start 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 mine. It's a yeah. not only is this book absolutely freaking amazing, everybody, and everyone should get it, but the forwards I think are as good. I can't say better, but as good, if not better than the rest of the book. And the rest of the book is amazing. This whole thing is amazing. I hope you're getting some royalties from it because everyone should get this. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, it, it, it's it, it's wonderful. So uh, your interpretation no, is, of those two there, forwards there is, is no, your... um, uh, look, look at it kind of Kabbalistically, okay? Uh, like to do that. There, there is. Uh, uh, it appears that you and me are two two different enter entities talking talking back and forth here. Okay, and at the moment, uh, with our powers of understanding and, and uh, uh, perception, it is that way. Okay, there's a dual thing uh, going on, but I'm actually processing absolutely everything about you in me and at the moment you are part of my head okay I you have no... exposed all of a sudden yeah and um uh you know, uh, Kabbalists break try to break everything else. Uh, you know, in uh, the the microcosm and the macrocosm, which only goes up to three. Uh, uh, as 
uh, broken up into four parts, okay? We've got our physical bodies here, our meat bodies, and that would, uh, and then we've got our thoughts and our imagination. And then beyond that, we've got we've got this, uh, you might call it uh, an intuitive, an intuitive sense. Like when a mother wakes up in the middle of the night and and knows her child is in danger. Okay, it's not even considered psychic phenomena. Okay, and th then there is the 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 absolute essence of any concept and the essence of being itself and that's at the top so that's the yod hey vav hey okay the, the hey final is this and the vav is this and, and the intuition is uh is that and that's uh so that's called uh uh nepish okay ruach and this soul intuition thing is called uh, neshama. And then the singularity-ness is uh, atzalith or the archetypal. Yeah, you, there's a yechida and he out there, but they're all sort of part of the greater. Yeah, oh, yeah, you split it up there. Yeah. And uh, I like the yechida because, uh, well, anyway. Yeah. You get You get your favorite pet names, you know. Uh, I sort of lump it up into high, you know, uh, life force. Yeah. Um, uh, now, you, our intellects are talking back and forth using our meat tongues, okay, which is our uh, an animal soul. But our intuition thing, okay, you and I are sitting inside each other's neshama just like that mother that wakes up in the middle of the night and that her child is in danger it's not because the child uh, uh, is sending any kind of message across a telegraph you know wireless message no that m mom would have got that message that impression if the child had been across uh, on the other side of the world, she would have got it instantly. And if the child would have been on the moon, she would have got that instantly. And if that child would have been on Alpha Centauri five light years from now and was in trouble, the mother would have got that right now. And it's not because a message was sent. It's because the child can never, ever escape the mother's neshema. We can't escape each other's neshima. We're bobbing around in a great neshima unity field, like we're chunks of pineapple in a neshima jello salad. Okay. The greater countenance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that neshima is the key to it's all in your head. You just have no idea how big your head is, okay? And everything that Stephen is saying, no, they have objective reality and things like that. He's absolutely right. But it's all taking place in the jello salad. Okay. That's how I sort of always interpreted that. So thank you for clarifying. Because actually, after I read those two forwards, I was like, Oh, maybe maybe Lon, if he was doing Solomonic magic and asked the spirit to confirm it would do what it said and and a bell was heard or some phenomena appeared, he would go, dear Lord, how could that happen? I thought it's all my head. Right. You know, no, 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 it's okay. already there. That's where I that's where I expect it to happen. <laughs> Well, I love all your podcasts. You did your a podcast with Praxis Behind the Obscure, my buddy Ryan in, in Korea. And uh, he's a very cool dude. I hope you enjoyed your time with him. And I'm just so proud, though, that I got to be the one to clarify this much debated point. I mean, if you were surreptitiously everywhere all at once on Facebook, you'd see how much this is still debated with fisticuffs by people most of the time who are just starting magic, but sometimes yeah. have been in it for 30 years like me or 
50, 60, or how, I, don't, I don't want to assume how long you've been doing magic, but it's a long time. So well, yeah. it, was, it was a brilliant uh, uh, idea and a fun suggestion uh, for us both to, to write a forward and introduction to, uh, uh, to, to that book. And, uh, you know, I've never read one word from Stephen Skinner that, that I didn't think was absolutely brilliant. And, and I have no, no fundamental, uh, uh, from my point of view, uh, d disagreement. I think he's one of the greatest magical minds in the, uh, living in the world today. So. Bad, but you met Regardi. Can I ask you, as a as a Golden Dawn person, I'm very curious. Like, can you, what was he like? Just not like intellectually or spiritually, like mannerisms. What was he just like? What was his vibe or behavior? Just I'm well. I'll never get to meet him, so I'm sort of curious. Uh he was so charming, and so cool, and so funny that within the first one minute that I was in his presence, I thought I wanted to be just like him when I grew up. Okay. He was he was the most charming, relaxed, uh, uh, insightful, uh, brilliant. Uh, and I know those are just, you know, uh, it's hyperbole, but uh, uh, almost immediately, I don't know what came out. Oh, he was wearing a, a medallion. Uh, uh, Constance and I went to his house with uh, the head of the OTO uh, at the time, Grady McMurtry. In, his house was in Studio City. And we got there around 10 o'clock in the morning. And he instantly uh, uh, wanted to uh, uh, pour us champagne cocktails at 10 in the morning, champagne cocktails. And it wasn't, you know, expensive champagne or anything, but he sort of, you know, made a thing about the sugar cube and the bitters and the, oh, and the wow. thing. And um, uh, we were sitting there sipping champagne cocktails at 10 in the morning. And um, uh, somehow it, the subject came up about uh, Freemasonry. And uh, uh, I mentioned that I wasn't a Freemason at the time, but I, I had uh, been a D-Malay as a kid. And I said, hey, you know, well, I'm a D-Malay. And he says, I am too. Okay. And it must have been in the first few years that there was a Demolay, because I think Demolay didn't even start till like 1911 or something like that. And so, you know, I had had a champagne cocktail. So I stood up. I said, do you remember the word? <laughs> and he says, I think so. And he stood up and there's a there's a way that you shake hands and do stuff with your hands before you whisper the word and he remembered the word it was very cool right. and so we got a big kick out of that um but uh uh later that morning he took us out to brunch and uh grady mcmurtry uh, uh regardy was very supportive of uh uh grady's uh resurrection if you will of the oto and a great deal of uh, the uh, inquiries that Regardi would get concerning the OTO, uh, he was uh, forwarding to, uh, to, uh, to Grady. Said, this is the OTO. This is who you need to talk to. And uh, the uh, inquiries that he would get concerning the AA, he would, uh, he would uh, uh, suggest that they contact Phyllis Seckler. And so th those are both my people too, you know. And uh, was was Regardi with Pat back then, or was that was he was Regardi with Pat at that time? Did you get to hang out with her? He was not with Pat. He was with um, 
uh, Alice. He was with Alice. I think this was, uh, this may have been after uh, uh, so we're talking 1976 or seven. Right. Uh, but anyway, uh, at brunch, Grady, uh, uh, you know, thanked him for all of his uh, his support and and uh, uh, and encouragement uh, uh, regarding and. Um, uh, Gerald York were this supporting the, they were the eyes of Horus. Okay. Uh, uh, and Grady offered him uh, to recognize him as a ninth degree OTO because uh, uh, Crowley had uh, addressed lots of correspondence to Grady or to uh, Regardi in the old days, uh, uh, addressing him as uh, T I T I T I. Uh, which is how thrice illuminated, thrice illustrious, thrice uh, intelligent. Oh. <laughs> okay. uh, so, uh, you know, Crowley considered him a, a ninth degree and Grady offered to recognize him as such. And, and Rigardi said, well, thank you. You know, I'm going to decline because I think I'm more uh, of uh, value to you. Uh, uh, you not not being involved at that level, and he said, "Besides, I'm a golden dawn man, and I'll I'll never forget that it was it was I'm a golden dawn man." And he had this uh, when you hear a recording of Regardi's voice, uh, it sounds like he's got just a tad of a speech. Uh, uh, in, not quite an impediment, it's but a little, list, right? a, a little, little <laughs> listy, uh, uh, just a tad of Elmer Fudd. All the, a lot of female occultists I know refer to it as a lisp, and they think it's the sexiest thing ever. Well, it added to his charm, I tell you, but in person you didn't hear it. Oh okay? wow! Really? But, but when you hear the recording of it. Uh. Then you hear it and you go, yeah, that's what he sounded. But I I didn't hear that, you know, that that part of it. Yeah, and it's fun to listen to his Enochian uh uh um oh sanu fao wasaji or you yeah. know flop, flop over like a wag doll, you know. And you did you didn't hear it because his charm was just so radiant. That you just there is no flaw in this <laughs> in this man, and he's really really one of the most charming magician I've ever met. Yeah, beautiful. That's such an amazing thing to get to hear. I'm so glad I I actually asked you that weird sounding question and that you understood what I meant to share all that because that's just history that like I I for me the 20th century and like the last 110 years of occult history and magical history is one of my favorite things. It's a big love. I was doing my my PhD dissertation on Evelyn Underhill up until uh, I got sick and then my supervisor died. Um, so I, I just love the history and hearing about Grady McMurtry and, and Rigardi and you all being in California and, and having cocktails for breakfast and, and creating what we get to enjoy today as this occult revolution that is truly like created the first golden age for magic since prehistoric times maybe or something the times where we didn't have good history that's for sure so thank you for that and and i have a question like given the the connect you've got to go so i'll let you go this is the last one if that needs to be but given how your experience with regardi and mcmurtry and all that would you say it's fair to describe the golden dawn tradition as a broken tradition you know it depends on who is working it at the moment okay uh, no, I don't uh, see the tradition as, as being broken. Uh, uh, I, I sort of see it as the, the like I said, like the like the crown, the the the, uh, the golden dawn as uh, originally at its height, originally in that what twenty years of of its uh, uh, golden age. Uh, was sort of the the formula of Osiris at its 
at, at its peak. It was the adepts, the adepts of the uh, of the uh, aeon of aeon of Horus, not the not the degeneration of the of the age of Horus, not the medieval, you know, crap, you know, of uh, of the decay of the formula, but truly the adepts of it. And they did indeed, in my opinion, uh, pave pave the way for the 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 next uh, next aeon. Uh, but there are uh, various practitioners operating. Uh, uh, some, I, I think, on the on the surface. Uh, very uh, elegantly and and uh, 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 traditionally, uh, that I do sort of see as uh, a broken application of that. Uh, in other words, not, uh, uh, I you know anybody that's doing magical work, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say anything. Uh, uh, negative because everybody is operating, I think, on their uh, as best they can. But there are some uh, Golden Dawn uh, uh, groups that I think uh, are a healthy representation of the of the magic and the formula, and those that are not. And uh, just like there's there's bad pennies and yeah. bad apples in, in in every organization. Uh, in 2002, and we were literally doing a neophyte initiation here in Vancouver when the front door was broken in and our sentinel attacked by none other than David Griffin. Disrupting the entire initiation, I had to get off the dais. The whole temple came out to hear the disturbance and saw our sentinel with a claymore held against his chest, trying to get him out and him trying to hit it away from her. It was clown town. Crazy. What a story. Well, eh? I, I, I would I would probably interpret that as an unhealthy uh, uh, application. Yeah. Well, he wanted yeah. us to bow down and make him the chief of our temple, even though we had no idea who he was really we just well we just knew he was uh uh he was a uh, a uh, 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 he tried to sort of i think uh you know he was a bad he was a bad apple that came from chris monastra's great group and and then tried to and then he trademarked the name so that's history we don't need to go into that so it's on the past. well but i was i asked about the broken things are pretty obvious and the and the uh what I'm very encouraged about is the uh, what I'm seeing uh, as a uh, as sort of a hybrid uh, ta uh, taking the formula into the Aeon of Horus formula as 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 if it would be uh, uh, like here's the, here's the running the you know how you before you jump you take a running leap okay it's it's like uh I, i've seen uh, uh well i guess the, the easiest way to describe it is uh 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 taking the 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 golden dawn uh formula uh, uh, to the place where you do Take it into the next, the next step, uh, the next uh, sort of logical, uh, logical step, and giving uh, uh, not only uh, total total respect but total uh, 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 utilization of the of the Golden Dawn formula and uh, images and stuff because uh, you you never. You never throw the baby Jesus out with the bathwater. You hear that? You hear that? He hears you. Thank you, he says. That was, in, this is incidentally was given to me while I was 
uh, doing a guest lecture at Canterbury for Dr. Angela Voss's PhD and grad students by the very Golden Dawn chief adept who was calling me a basically a oath breaker, you know, before this, we started this interview. You gotta love it, eh? You gotta love it. You gotta love life. It's just so fucking crazy, man. I know. I, I love this shit. I love it too. A, a listener did have a question. I th I said, I think you've answered it in many books, but he wants to know where you got the name Baba Lawn from. So uh, because he asked, I asked. Well, uh, my name is Lawn. And Baba, Baba is a, a avuncular term of endearment and and respect in in the, in the East, in India, and things like that. And uh, Baba Lan is how Crowley spells Babylon, and it adds a hundred to a hundred and fifty six, uh, which is a very sacred Kabbalistic number, and uh, it's a play on words. And uh, my my father always told, and my father, was he was a Freemason, 32nd degree Freemason. He joined the Masons the year I was born, 1948. And, uh, but he wasn't a mystical guy, you know, he was... Uh, but he wasn't a religious guy either. If he wasn't a Mason, he would have been an atheist. And that's almost that's almost uh, what he told us. Uh, because he wasn't, a, my mother was sort of an evangelical and he he was tolerant, but he wasn't a, uh, wasn't a religious guy. And I said, well, gee, you, you, you act like you're an atheist. No, I can't be an atheist, son. I'm a Freemason. <laughs> <laughs> that's, but, you know, but I've that, got my dues receipt to prove it otherwise. And but he said, "Look, never, ever, ever change your name because I always complained about Milo. I always complained about Lawn. None of my friends were named Lawn. None of my friends were named Milo. Duquette sounded cool because it was French, so I like that." But he always always insisted that I capitalize the Q in the name. So uh, uh, most Duquettes in the world just have a small Q. Uh, but he said, never change your name. It's a magic name. And this is coming from a very unmagical, unmystical guy. It's a magic name. Never change it. I chose your name on purpose, just the way it is. Never change it. So I've always used my own name as my magical motto. Uh, well, I've got magical mottos, AA kind of stuff, you know, front yeah. of this and front of that. But when people uh, in groups and things like that, I'm Frutter GLMP, you know. And uh, I'll use my initials because that's uh, LMD, Lamed. That's a good one. Yeah. Lamed Ben Clifford. Yeah. My, father's, my father's name was Clifford. And uh, so it's LMD, son of Clifford. Lamed Ben Clifford. That's my that's my magical name. I use that. And I've always used Lon Milo Duquette when I started writing, when I started songwriting, when I started publishing and, and singing and recording. It's always been Lon Milo Duquette. And uh, uh uh, you know, uh, just replace English letters with stock Hebrew letters. It adds up to 444. And 444 is, you know, all multiples of uh, 111 are cool. But 444 is not, it's not 666, you know. 444 is um, what I use for this podcast as a sacred number. I used to drop the episodes every day during COVID at 444 and such. Oh, well, that's cool. But it, it was a certain sense of identity, you know. I think it, Kabbalistically, uh, uh, biblically, I, I think the word plague of frogs adds up to 444. So, 444 and, and is so, also Dalit Mem Tav, Dalit yeah. Mem Tav, DMT. Yeah. Okay. Doorway. 
to the infinite ocean of Bina balances all things within you. Yeah, it's it's really it's a he was right. It's a magical, magical name, and so uh, uh, one fifty six is uh, uh, a, a very sacred uh, number in Thelema, number one, because it's Babylon. And uh, uh, at Monday Night Magic class, uh, uh, you know, some people refer to their father as, as dad. Okay. My son always called me Papa. Okay, which is pretty much Baba. And uh, at Monday Night Magic class, uh, for years, especially when our son was home, um, everybody called me Papa. All of his friends called me Papa. Uh, even after they're 30 years old, <laughs> I could I would go shopping and one of his old friends in the parking lot, hey, Papa. So I'm, and um, Baba Babylon makes a lot of lot of sense to me, and and uh, a lot of a lot of my friends call me Babylon and things like that. So, well, I'm so glad actually that I asked that question, even though I sort of knew the answer, but your answer was wonderful and 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 uh, circuitous and 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 informative. So yeah, th thanks to Caleb Burr for that question. Thanks, listeners, for all the questions and all the praise that you guys showered. I can't just repeat it all because that would be a whole podcast <laughs> you know? yeah um it has been such a such a treat to talk to you um i don't know what well, else it's been my pleasure too on yeah. this this yeah. hot it's a hot it's hot for me but i can't imagine down there i hope you have air conditioning of course you probably must no, no. Oh, dear no. lord heaven oh wow saints preserve us jesus yeah we uh we open up the house in the morning and put some fans on and uh, cool it off. And uh, we have air conditioning, but it, it it's really bad for our nose and throat and things like that. We 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 don't have good air conditioning uh, here, so uh, we just use fans at the moment. So. Yeah, that's what that's what we got. So I, I turned them off for the podcast, of course, so it's nice and toasty in here. Um, I just yeah. wanted to say the reason I, 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 I work, one of the main magicians I work with in town is an OTO guy, a brother Mason as well. Um, I, ironically, the second degree of Masonry is the only Mason degree I turned down, but that's because they sort of didn't communicate with me after the first initiation. And I didn't want to go through a second one without any, anything, no contact, like first initiation, no contact, then a call ready for tonight no i'm not so and i've never been able to finish the blue lodge as a result I, i'm still trying today and they're like not really uh it's heads, really heads should roll for the heads should roll for that that's yeah. what every american mason i've ever talked to has said and yet i had some help to try and finish the it here again and it was just uh yeah it, it's unfortunate but I asked about the, uh, so I, I, sorry, that just popped in my head because you mentioned about don't refusing initiations. And I did actually refuse one one time because I didn't, I, I, yeah, I couldn't just do initiation after initiation with nothing in between. It didn't make any sense to me, especially having gone through the whole Golden Dawn experience. I'm like, what is this? I don't know. Yeah, what it, no, it, it's different. I, I wouldn't expect anything in between that you don't put there yourself. Yeah, there was no communication with me about what I needed to do or learn or what any of it meant. Um, I just went to the first initiation, did my fellow craft. Then we drank scotch and toasted the queen for two hours. And then I went home and that, and then there, there was a call for another initiation. And that's sort of, so unfortunately I might have to wait till I get back to the States and just sort of start over with a new lodge down there, sub, sub, you know, under the oh. key. Um, well, yeah. yeah, you, you very seldom get any um, particular esoteric thrills and chills uh, but there's preparation I, needed for this for the initiation oh yeah yeah they should have given you a coach and you should have had memory work and you should have nothing no they they dropped the ball on you big time and now yeah. they won't let me finish the degrees at another lodge because they want me back even though they're defunct 
and they're two hours out of town now as opposed to I want to finish my degrees at the same lodge my great great grandfather was a most worshipful master of five minutes from where I live right now where all my current friends are current members but they won't let me um, do it it's really was, far out you were treated scandalously yep okay. yeah yeah the masons tried to sign me up at pantheacon and i told them that little story and the guy with the big bolt the big funny hat that you might have seen walked around you know the one that guy meant yeah yeah he, yeah. he was just like he was like brother oh my god oh. He, he basically wanted to adopt me after that and i was like i really i it, if it wasn't for the attitude of masons like yourself and him and the other ones i met when i was at isis oasis just there around geyserville and sonoma county i wouldn't have ever considered finishing and going back to masonry but i had so much so i met had met such good interesting people even just on the road um because i was wearing a hat i didn't know you weren't meant to wear light under third degree i didn't know that someone gave me a hat i needed a hat so i wore it and so people would see or say are you a mason you just have a hat and i'd be like no i'm first degree i can do the first degree handshake and they'd be like oh tell me your story and they were so nice just random people i met in california that i was like you know what when i get back to canada i'm gonna finish blue lodge and it's been a few years and it doesn't look like it's gonna happen so i might have to wait till i get back to the states so oh have you told your story to try to try? Like, no, I don't think so. No. He started a podcast and he's sort of not really talking to me, so I don't know why. Maybe I think he's he likes to do his own thing. I don't know. Yeah. Oh. Well, if you if you got his info, uh his uh, uh his number, tell him I encouraged you to uh to give him a call and tell your story. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And just the last the last point, the reason I've mentioned the broken tradition thing is cuz Foolish Fish made a video on initiation this week and called the broke, the Golden Dawn a broken tradition in contradistinction to other systems out there like Quirea and Gallery of Magic and stuff like that. And I pushed back. I wrote a comment. I said, it's not a broken tradition. It's a beautiful tradition that spawned all of so much, so many wonderful things and is alive and well today. So why are you calling it that? And he, he gave me a heart for that. And so I assume he sort of liked my point. But then Marco oh, Visconti yeah. jumped on it and doubled down. I was like, no, it's a fucking broken tradition. And I just, I wanted to your opinion because, you know, you're so respected. And I'm, as someone who works with a local, my buddy, Frater Bacchus, he's an AA, OTO, Mason guy. We do magic together. We build tools together. We jam music together. We have, he has a little studio. He's one of my best friends in town and made magical friends, though. We haven't seen each other so much recently because of covid but the I, I want i i like i'm an aquarius i like the idea of people working together and being communal and and having at least you know some a bit of loving kindness for each other and this constantly like see this this nonsensical the golden dawn and oto and aa and these traditions are so similar as like you were having cocktails with mcmurtry and regardi i think this this animosity that me new members or even reputable members promote is just so heartbreaking to me it's so discouraging to me it often does just put me into the doldrums for long periods of time i don't know i don't it's not no, a question. don't, it's just, don't ever expect thought. anybody else to to uh uh make you happy for sure just for have, sure just have to just have to bring to it what you what you will and um, uh, honestly, in, in 30 or 40 years, when people grow old and die, uh, you find out that, that people that, that you have big problems with uh, sometimes turn out to just be wonderful, wonderful people that uh, also uh, grow up and grow in the same way that you grow up and grow too. So remember, we've only got so much uh, uh, time during this particular blink of a consciousness eye and uh, that uh, and we've only got so many cast of characters to, to work with. You probably don't don't want the ones that, that break in and <laughs> break through the door and demand shit you know you could probably avoid them uh the but, old your uh, leader has arrived in flames and glory <laughs> oh, hearing a that, trademark document from the government it is very stylish that was uh, <laughs> oh lord 
Well, okay. well I gotta thank go. you so much for being on here with us today, for sharing with me your grace and love and wit and, and humor. I can't thank you enough. It's always an honor to cross paths with you. And uh, you personally, your work and your presence has given me so much um, in my life in the past, just in the past uh, seven years uh, since I first met you with Troy and, and got to go to the Gnostic Mass. And that was an eye-opening experience for me that really changed my whole opinion on on my brothers across the aisle in the in Thelema and uh and uh I'm glad it did because I've had so many found so many friendships and magical relationships that are bring a lot into my life so I hope that we can continue to have that kind of uh grace towards each other oh me too me too and right. uh, g g give me a uh a heads up when number 93 comes up for uh broadcast it'll be very soon and i will definitely give you a heads up good sir thank you so much and as you say 93 brother 93 thank Love you for having me. cheers have a great day you too